Welcome to the Stephen F. Udvar Hazy Center, an annex of the Smithsonian Air and Space Museum. Unfortunately, today our usual docent, Al, is not available, but this audio tour was created to mimic a typical Al tour as much as possible. When we come here, Al, who spent a career in the IC between CIA and DIA, focuses primarily on the military capabilities aspect of air power for us and dials that down even more into the intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance support aircraft provides. But first, a little about the museum. The Udvar Hazy Center was completed in 2003 to celebrate the 100th anniversary of the Wright Brothers' historic first powered flight in Kitty Hawk, North Carolina. The main museum on the National Mall is one of the smallest Smithsonian Museum buildings, and it needed a larger location to display many of the truly historic aircraft that couldn't fit in that main building. Stephen F. Udvar Hazy was born in Soviet-occupied Hungary and fled to the United States with his family in 1958 when he was 12 years old. During his 20s, in the mid to late 1960s, he was watching the aircraft industry transition from turbine engines to jets and realized that there was a lot of money to be made in buying aircraft and leasing them to different airlines which he began to do in the early 1970s. Well, he was right about the money-making venture, because when the Air and Space Museum was fundraising for a new annex by Dulles International Airport, he was able to present the institution with a gift of $66 million, still one of the largest single donations in the Smithsonian's history. So if you're wondering what it takes to get your name on a museum building, now you know. This tour is designed to be a brief look at the evolution of aircraft and its connection with military capabilities, specifically ISR missions. We will try to move chronologically from World War I to World War II to the Cold War and then talk about space. With very few exceptions, the museum is not allowed to display aircraft that is still in the active U.S. arsenal which is why there are next to no 4th or 5th generation aircraft present. The F-35 prototype is on display, and we will talk a little about that before we move into the space domain. With that said, some of the aircraft is laid out in an other-than-chronological manner, so we will be jumping around a little bit, beginning with our first aircraft, located down the main stairwell, past the information desk the SR-71 Blackbird. Please pause this recording until you are in front of the SR-71. You likely remember from your Air Force's lesson that the SR portion of this aircraft's nomenclature reveals its primary mission of surveillance and reconnaissance. At the end of World War II, we were very concerned about the Soviet military threat, in particular the Soviet nuclear threat, We didn't know how many surface-to-surface nuclear missiles the Soviets had. We didn't know how many strategic bombers they had. And our intelligence collection capability against the Soviet Union was pretty limited at the time. To fix that, the CIA contracted with the Lockheed Company to build an airplane that could fly at 70,000 feet, which was higher than any surface-to-air missile could reach. That airplane was the U-2 and they contracted with a company to build a camera that could take really good pictures from 70,000 feet. The camera was put in the U-2, and it flew successfully over the Soviet Union, taking very good pictures for several years. The CIA assessed that at some point the Soviets would be able to develop a surface-to-air missile that could reach 70,000 feet, so they had two other initiatives underway by 1960. They had contracted with the Lockheed Company again, this time to build a replacement airplane called the A-12, which would become the SR-71, and a second program, which we will talk about at the very end of the tour. The A-12, the CIA version of the SR-71, was a single-seat plane, and it was designed to fly at Mach 3, three times the speed of sound, or about 5 miles per hour faster than the U-2. (laughs) 
It could also reach 3 miles higher than the U-2, which pushed its flight ceiling to about 85,000 feet. This was really audacious since the U-2 was already the highest flying airplane ever built and now the CIA wanted to go higher and faster. In addition to that, the CIA said it had to be built with stealth characteristics in mind. It had to have a very small radar signal which is why it has all of these unique angles. Developing a U-2 replacement was a good idea because also in 1960, the Soviets got lucky and shot down a U-2. If you were familiar with the story of Air Force turned CIA pilot Francis Gary Powers or have seen the Tom Hanks film Bridge of Spies based on his shoot down, you know what happened. An SA-2 surface-to-air missile was fired at the U-2 and exploded underneath it. The missile didn't hit the plane, it couldn't quite reach high enough, but the shock wave from the explosion tore the plane apart. Powers survived the shootdown, but was captured by the Soviets and put on a very public show trial. The A-12 proved a little difficult to fly, since aside from regular flying duties, the pilot also had to navigate and operate the camera alone, which was a little tough to do at high speeds and high altitudes. By the mid-1960s, the CIA stopped flying the A-12, but it was such a good airplane that the Air Force wanted to take over the program, and they wanted to put more sensors on it. The A-12 only had a single camera. So, in addition to the one film camera, the Air Force put a radar camera and some other sensors in their version. They wanted to add a second seat, so the pilot only had to worry about flying and the reconnaissance systems officer could worry about everything else. Because of the extra sensors and the extra passenger, the SR-71 was a little bigger than the A-12, but by and large, they were the same plane. The SR-71 is an engineering marvel. It was designed by one of the best aircraft engineers of all time, a man named Kelly Johnson, who built one of the most complex machines ever without the help of computers or other digital assistants. On the ground, the airframe of the SR-71 wasn't solid, so it would leak after being fueled, but due to the heat it generated at the speed and altitude it routinely flew at, its titanium body would expand, sealing those leaks. These planes would fuel up just enough on the ground to get airborne and would then link up with a refueler to top off. I just said that the SR-71 body is titanium, but the United States doesn't have any titanium deposits. Do you know which country has a lot of titanium? Russia. So, to get the material we needed to build the SR-71, the CIA set up bicycle manufacturing fronts in Europe and purchased the titanium from the Soviets so we could turn around and use it to spy on the Soviet Union. A few more fun facts about this plane before we move on. Because it flew at the edge of space, pilots had to wear pressurized spacesuits in case the cabin lost pressure, and the only way they could eat was by sucking specially prepared food packets through a straw. I have heard pilots talking about that, saying that the plane's windows routinely reached 600 degrees and they could heat up their food by pressing the food packs against the red-hot windows. I said a moment ago that Lockheed built the SR-71. Lockheed's super-secret development division is called Skunk Works, and the Skunk Works logo is a happy-looking skunk with its arms crossed. When this plane was retired, before it was flown out here to be put in the museum, Skunk Works painted a sad skunk on its tail. Though the SR-71 is one of the most amazing aircraft ever built, it was retired in 1989 after less than 40 years of service because the reconnaissance and surveillance aspects of the Blackbird became obsolete not long after it was first fielded. It was designed to take film pictures, so a flight would have to take off, often from Turkey, fly its several hours long mission, land, often in Scandinavia or Japan depending on its route, remove the film, have it developed, and send it by courier to an analysis center, which was never where the film was developed for exploitation. 
This would result in intelligence that was several hours, if not days old, at a time when we now had satellites with digital downlinks in space. There was talk about installing digital downlinks on the SR-71s, but the satellites were more cost-effective and the plane was scrapped. This particular plane arrived at Dulles in 1990 after flying from Los Angeles in 1 hour, 4 minutes, and 20 seconds. Once it passed over Dulles, it took about 15 minutes to slow down enough to turn around, and by that time, it was already over the Atlantic Ocean. It is still the fastest jet to ever fly, and again, it's been retired for more than 40 years. If you look in the Guinness Book, the official speed record is 2,183 miles per hour by an SR-71, but that is a bit deceiving. Since the SR-71 is a reconnaissance plane, all of its specifications were classified, and to set an official record, you have to be observed by this international body based in Paris from start to finish. So we didn't want to give away the top speed of the SR-71. For the record-breaking flight, the pilot was told not to fly any faster than 2,200 miles an hour. The official speed record is 2,183 miles per hour, but it is commonly understood that on every operational mission it actually flew, it was flying faster than that. If you will turn your back to the SR-71 and look up above the World War II gallery, you will see hanging from the ceiling a Lysander. This small British plane had no photographic capability, and yet none other than Winston Churchill claimed that the intelligence gathered by this unassuming aircraft shortened World War II by at least nine months. Once the Germans overran France, the British would cram the back of these planes full of contraband, such as weapons, radio, food, and other supplies, and deliver those to the French resistance. The Lysander could land in the dark on unimproved runways, such as a farmer's field. After landing and unloading its cargo, it could then smuggle people out in the now empty rear seat to give intelligence reports to the Allies before being smuggled back into France. After the United States entered the war, one of, if not the very first American paratroopers to clandestinely jump into occupied France, Private and later Staff Sergeant Jumpin' Joe Byerly of the 506th Parachute Infantry Regiment, 101st Airborne Division of the Band of Brothers fame, jumped from the back of a Lysander into France on April 14, 1944, more than a month and a half before the D-Day invasion, to deliver a bandolier of gold to the French resistance worth about a million dollars in today's money. After a week on the lam, Byerly was also extracted from France via a Lysander and brought back important intelligence for those planning the invasion of Normandy. We are now going to move over to the World War I gallery. Please pause this recording until you are standing near the military uniform in the glass case in that gallery. In Al's professional opinion, the backbone of military capabilities is intelligence. And in the early days of flight, the first aircraft, even before we had airplanes, the first balloons, were used for reconnaissance, for intelligence purposes. The first airplanes were also used for intel purposes. The oldest airplane here in the museum is up above us. You all know the Wright brothers invented the airplane. The first flight was December 17, 1903, but they weren't the only ones who were trying to build a plane. There was also a man named Samuel Langley. He was a renowned scientist at the very end of the 19th century. He also happened to be the director of the Smithsonian. He had built these small model airplanes, little steam engine models with wings that could make little flights. And because he was a well-known scientist, he got a lot of publicity for these models. In 1898, we were fighting the Spanish in the Spanish-American War, and we were using tethered balloons with people up in these balloons doing our reconnaissance. The War Department thought if Langley could build one of his models bigger and could put a person in it who could fly around the battlefield, it would be much better than having a balloon tethered in a single spot. 
So the idea for the very first airplane was for reconnaissance purposes. The War Department gave Langley $50,000 to build his airplane. $50,000 is a decent chunk of change now, but it was substantially more in the late 1890s. It took a few years, but he built the plane you see here called the Langley Aerodrome. It's basically an upscaled copy of one of his models. As you can see, it has two sets of wings, an engine, and a little cockpit hanging below everything else, though there are no real controls, so the pilot would be really more of a passenger. And the idea was this would fly over the Potomac River and then settle down on the water when it ran out of fuel. In October 1903, he put this plane on a houseboat, and on top of the houseboat was a catapult. He talked his mechanic, a guy named Charles Manley, into being a guinea pig to ride in the cockpit and fly along in this airplane. Manley was so optimistic that it would fly that he sewed a compass into the leg of his trousers. I have no idea where he thought he might go, but he didn't want to get lost, just in case. So, October 1903, they start the engines, they shot off the catapult, and this is a picture of the very first flight. It went right down into the water. It didn't fly at all. And the reason we have this picture is, again, because Langley was a well-known guy. He was building an airplane, the government spent all this money on it, so the newspapers were lining the shores to see the very first airplane flight. After the failure, Langley wasn't frustrated, he just thought he needed to make the plane a bit stronger. So he fished it and poor Manley out of the river, he rebuilt it and tried again the first week of December 1903, and this is a picture of the second flight. Again, an absolute failure. This time, the newspapers ridiculed Langley and ridiculed the government for wasting all this money. The New York Times said that humans weren't going to fly for a million years. Literally, that is what the headline said. A million years. One week later, Orville and Wilbur had their first flight at Kitty Hawk in North Carolina. Which to me is an amazing story because here's this scientist with all these resources and all this money and he couldn't figure out the problem with flight. And Orville and Wilbur, two bicycle makers from Dayton, Ohio, were able to figure it out. And very simply, to me, the lesson learned is that Orville and Wilbur were like the first systems engineers. They took the problem of flight and broke it down into individual parts. What shape wings do you need for lift? What type of power do you need? What type of control do you need? As opposed to just building something and trying it out. The Langley Aerodrome is not capable of flying. In fact, the joke at the museum is that this is the highest the plane has ever been. The funniest thing about this plane may be that idea that it would fly along the river and then settle down on the water. You can see that it has some pontoons on it, fore and aft, so that it can float on the river, but if you look at where the cockpit is, well, Manly was going to get wet no matter what because those pontoons are higher up on the frame than the cockpit is. When the Wright brothers built their airplane, the first customer for the airplane was the U.S. Army, because the Army thought that with the airplane they could do reconnaissance from the air, you know, you can see what the other side is doing, and that would bring an end to war. They thought their machine would end war. Little did they know that in a few short years, it would do just the opposite. Keeping in mind the idea that they were to be used for reconnaissance purposes, when airplanes started to be developed in those early days for the military, the focus was always on intelligence. The first airplane used by the Army was a Wright Brothers plane called the Military Flyer, and the Army purchased it in late 1909 for reconnaissance. The first one used in actual service was this airplane that you can get a better look at when you turn the corner called the Bellaria. It was simple to take apart, move around, and reassemble somewhere else, and was also used for reconnaissance. The very first time it was used for reconnaissance in an actual combat zone was 1911. The Italians used it to keep an eye on the Turks during the Italo-Turkish War in North Africa, and about a week or so after that first reconnaissance flight, 
Another recon pilot brought a little hand grenade with him and threw it down on the Turks and conducted the first aerial bombardment, such as it was. The next aircraft we're going to talk about in this section, the Fowler Gage biplane, predates World War I, and believe it or not, you are looking at the first plane to fly nonstop from the Pacific Ocean to the Atlantic Ocean, and it did it in 1913. So how do you think that this airplane with this tiny gas tank could fly from the Pacific Ocean to the Atlantic Ocean? Yes, it really did, but it was over the Isthmus of Panama. In the early days of aviation, everyone was trying to set a record somehow, so a guy named Robert Fowler built this airplane and he thought that he would set a record with his ocean-to-ocean flight in Panama. It was actually a pretty dangerous flight because airplanes back then were not that reliable, the engines were not that reliable, and apart from the Panama Canal construction zone, everything else was pretty much jungle down below him, so he didn't have anywhere for a safe emergency landing until he reached the coast. Nevertheless, he completed the flight, and he brought along a passenger. The passenger sat in the front and Fowler in the back seat, and the passenger brought a movie camera and took movies and still pictures of the Panama Canal being built, and then they wrote an article that was published in a magazine the next year about the flight. Here's the article. Panama and the Canal from an Airplane. After the publication, the U.S. War Department had them both arrested for espionage because they published pictures of the Panama Canal which was a military zone, and its defenses. In fact, this picture right here is the one that got them in the most trouble, showing one of the artillery pieces set up around the canal. The article even pointed out some weaknesses in the defenses, and the War Department classified that as espionage, because that intelligence could help anyone who might want to attack or blow up the canal. Fowler was able to prove that the Panama Canal Commission gave him permission to take the flight and cooler heads prevailed. They weren't prosecuted, but it shows the sensitivity to intelligence from the air. The fact that this flight over the Panama Canal resulted in espionage charges against the pilot and passenger. Across the aisle and hanging from the ceiling is a Newport 28 originally built by the French in 1917. After the introduction of powered flight, the Wright brothers litigiously protected the many powered flight copyrights they had in the United States, so there was very little innovation in the U.S. aviation industry before the First World War. The brothers did not enjoy the same legal protections in Europe, though, and the German, French, and British aviation industries, among others, took off. Okay, um, yeah, no pun intended there. I, I, I didn't realize what I'd written until I just read it. Anyway, those industries took off, and the planes used in World War I had little in common with the initial versions of the Wright Flyer. I already mentioned the Bellario, one aisle over. The Newport up above us is another one of these newer airplanes. When the U.S. entered World War I, there were really no suitable American-made planes for the fight. The Lafayette Squadron, American pilots who signed up to fly for the French before the U.S. entered the war, flew Newports. And after the U.S. joined the war, the French supplied more Newports for the American pilots flying under the Stars and Stripes. While the gift of these aircraft was partly out of necessity, since we didn't have any fighters of our own, it was also in part because French pilots had moved on to the SPAD. You see, the new ports had a slight design flaw. In too steep of a dive, the top set of wings tended to shear off the airplane, causing the aircraft to torpedo into the ground like a Roman candle. Once enough had been produced, France gave the U.S. spads too. The iconic image on the side of this particular new port is the hat in the ring and harkens back to the slogan of the first U.S. pilots to fly for the United States during the war. It was to indicate that after sitting out the first few years of the war and after much debate, the U.S. had finally joined the war effort and thrown its hat in the ring. Between 1919 and 1921, the U.S. Navy used new ports for the initial trials to launch planes from ships that would eventually be called aircraft carriers. 
The statue under the new port is of staunch aviation advocate Army Brigadier General Billy Mitchell. Next to the statue, this plane with the eagle overlaid on a red circle painted on the fuselage is Mitchell's SPAD-16. If you look at the left side of the landing gear, you will notice a small propeller attached to a generator used to power some electronic equipment in Mitchell's plane. Behind the generator and on the other side of the fuselage, you can see something hanging under the plane that looks like a metal weight in the shape of a zeppelin. Mitchell could lower the weight, which was attached to a telegraph antenna, and send wireless Morse code intelligence reports back to headquarters around the battlefield. Across the aisle is an early French bomber called a caudron. If you look underneath the cockpit of the aircraft, you will see another weight hanging down, which is also attached to a telegraph antenna, so it wasn't just fighters that could send reports. And if you look in front of the antenna, you can see another innovation that, while not directly connected with intel collection, would allow bombers to target locations designated for destruction from intel reports. There is a square hatch that the pilot could open up and drop bombs from. Before the innovation of the hatch, bombs were thrown over the side of the plane, which proved much less effective than this new delivery method. We're now going to go to the other side of this gallery to see one of the most famous aircraft of World War I, the Sopwith Camel. Please pause this recording until you reach the next aircraft. Do you know who the most famous Sopwith Camel pilot is? If you said Snoopy, you would be correct. Now, Camel is not the Sopwith's official designation, but refers to the distinctive hump created by the cowling over the two front-facing Vickers machine guns ahead of the cockpit. Many of the early World War I aircraft, including the Camel here, didn't initially have guns on them as they were just being used for reconnaissance. But the intelligence being collected was so good that pilots began bringing up their own guns, so if they saw the enemy also collecting, they could shoot the other pilot down before that intelligence could be exploited. And then they started mounting the guns on airplanes. One of the first people to mount a gun on their airplane was a French pilot named Roland Garros. If that name is familiar to you, it's because the French Open is named after him, and so is the stadium in Paris where the tournament is hosted each year. He is a national hero in France. Garros thought that he needed a gun right in front of him so he could shoot straight. But of course, the spinning propeller is in the way. So he put a deflector on the propeller. He thought that if a bullet hit the propeller, it would just ricochet off his deflector and he'd be fine. He mounted the deflectors and they worked really well. He shot down four German planes before he shot down himself. Yes, he survived that crash. He nearly survived World War I, but was killed when he was shot down a day before his 30th birthday, less than six weeks before the armistice. When the Germans and the British and the French all saw that you could put a gun behind the propeller, they each independently devised a mechanism to have an interrupter so the gun would not fire when the propeller was in the way. It was pretty remarkable technology for 1916-1917, and pretty remarkable that they all came up with it at almost the exact same time. And it was truly independent development. There is no evidence of industrial espionage allowing one side to copy the other's idea. Now jumping across the aisle to World War II, you can see the British Hurricane Fighter that was one of the heroes of the Battle of Britain. After the Germans overran France in 1940, they turned their attention to the UK. This was the first major military campaign in history to be fought entirely by air forces. The Luftwaffe sent small bombers like the Stuka dive bomber and the Messerschmitt bomber over London and several other important industrial cities to try to pound the British into submission. What is remarkable about this early World War II battle is that the Germans had much better aircraft, but the Brits, to their credit, built a very advanced reconnaissance system. Radar had been invented in Britain in 1935, and by 1939, 
they had built a series of early warning radar along the coast, which allowed them to detect when the Germans were coming. This early warning was vital because it meant that they didn't have to fly constant combat air patrols, which would have been taxing on the pilots who would have been up in the air all the time with very little recovery time in between flights. And it also would have put a lot more wear and tear on the aircraft and they would have needed much more maintenance and repair. When the Germans were en route to attack, the British had two types of planes they would scramble to meet them. The Hurricane that would fly high and attack the bombers, and another airplane called the Spitfire, which was faster and more maneuverable, which would fly lower and go after the fighter escorts. And not to take anything away from the grit of the British pilots or the quality of their fighters, but the early warning system, this intelligence capability they had set up, went a long way in the Battle of Britain toward helping British pilots fight off the German aerial invasion. Now if you look back in the direction of the SR-71, way down at the end there, you can see a plane with a tiger's mouth painted on it. That is the P-40. And it was the top American fighter at the beginning of World War II. It was made famous by a group called the Flying Tigers before America even entered the war. In 1940, there was a group of American volunteers who went over to China to fight the Japanese, ostensibly as part of the Chinese Air Force, and they flew the P-40, which at that time was our top American fighter. But because we figured that we would be getting involved in the war at some point, a real push went on to develop better fighter and better bomber technology so that we didn't wind up flat-footed like we did when we jumped into World War I. When the U.S. entered the war after Pearl Harbor, the Navy quickly superseded the P-40 with that other plane next to it, the F-4 Corsair. The Corsair was built to be a Navy plane, and every Navy plane was built to fly off of aircraft carriers, and that remains true today, which means that they have to be built sturdier than other airplanes, especially in the landing gear. When you land on the deck of an aircraft carrier, you land really hard. It's sometimes described as a controlled crash. The robust landing gear is really obvious when you compare landing gear of Navy planes and Air Force planes and you can do that a little better over in the Cold War gallery. When the Navy built the Corsair, they decided they needed the most powerful engine and the most powerful propeller to make an effective fighter. They actually built the Corsair around the engine, and the engine was so big that to keep the propeller from hitting the ground, it had to have very long landing gear, and very long landing gear is not great for landing hard on an aircraft carrier. So they made an adjustment. They made that little curve there in the wing to shorten the landing gear so it could land on the carrier and still keep the propeller from hitting the ground. But the Navy still found it difficult to fly. With such a big engine that was tail down and nose high, it was hard to see when it was landing, so the Navy let the Marines keep the Corsair, which then became the top Marine airplane in World War II. When the Navy moved on from the Corsair, they went with the plane up above us, the F-6F Hellcat. The wings fold up so you can fit a lot more of them on an aircraft carrier. It was also fast and maneuverable. One downside to the plane is that because of where the guns are mounted, about the midpoint on the wing, it had to have a standoff distance of about 200 yards when it was dogfighting, so the rounds being fired could converge at a single point in front of the plane, but the naval aviators loved their Hellcats. Okay, so the Marines had their top plane, the Navy had one that they loved, and now the Army Air Corps said they needed a fighter that could fly further and higher and faster than the P-40. The Army ended up with the P-38 Lightning. It was designed by Kelly Johnson, the same guy that would go on to design the SR-71. This is the first airplane that we had that flew more than 400 miles an hour. Very fast, very maneuverable. It looks different than the other airplanes. The twin engines gave it its speed and the guns on the nose made it more accurate than other aircraft. In the months after Pearl Harbor, technology was increasing at a very fast rate. We had better and better weapons. 
For reconnaissance, there was not a purpose-built recon plane until the U-2 in 1950. Since there were no purpose-built reconnaissance platforms in World War II, almost every plane was used for reconnaissance. For the reconnaissance version of the Lightning, they took the guns off and they put a camera in their place. And then these pilots would fly, usually all by themselves, out to do their reconnaissance missions and then come back. These were probably the most dangerous missions a pilot could fly in the war because they were unarmed, they usually did not have any escorts, and they would fly right over the most dangerous areas because that is what they wanted to get pictures of. And it wasn't just the Lightning. The Tiger, the Corsair, and the Hellcat were each used as reconnaissance aircraft in addition to their fighter role. Even the big bombers, like the one you see behind the Lightning, was used for reconnaissance purposes. Going back to the Lightning, somebody thought, hey, we should put another guy in this airplane to take pictures. So they built a pod and thought, here's a guy that could be strapped under the wing. You give him a camera and he can take pictures himself and the plane can keep its guns. It was an interesting idea, but it didn't work out that well. All right, the Army, Navy, and Marine Corps had their favorites but the top-of-the-line fighter of World War II was probably the P-51 Mustang, which you can just make out on the other side of the raised walkway from here. This particular one is painted for its post-war racing career, not for tactical missions. Again, in the four or five years that we were fighting in the war, we kept developing newer and better aircraft. The P-51 could fly faster, further, and higher than the other fighters. Of course, the purpose of having a fighter was to escort the bombers, to protect the bombers, as they are flying toward their targets. Until D-Day, June 6, 1944, the airfields that we used to fly against the Germans were mostly in England, and we didn't have any fighter aircraft with the range to reach Germany, where the bombers were dropping their payloads. So most of the time, the fighters would escort the bombers only part way to the target, and then the bombers had to go the rest of the way unescorted, and as you might imagine, that's when we lost most of the bombers. The Mustang could fly the furthest and accompany the bombers all the way to their targets in Germany. This is why most World War II historians and aficionados say that the P-51 was the top American fighter in World War II. After talking about the P-51, Al likes to tell a story about a tour he once gave to a group of World War II veterans. There were all these old guys in their wheelchairs, and he was talking about the P-51, and one guy in his wheelchair said, I was a P-51 pilot, and that was, without a doubt, the best plane we had in the war. And then the guy in the wheelchair next to him said, Oh yeah, well I flew the P-47, and that's a plane that you'll be able to see when we get on the other side of the bomber. Anyway, he says, I flew the P-47, and that was a better airplane. And these guys got into such an argument that Al had to separate their wheelchairs. He thought they were going to come to blows. And then they turned to Al and asked him which one was the better airplane. Like, poor Al had to solve this argument. He told them, well, the P-51 could fly higher, faster, farther, and accompany the bombers all the way to the target and back, so it was a great airplane but it had a liquid-cooled engine. Engines get very hot. They need to be cooled either by air or liquid moving through them. The P-51 has a liquid-cooled engine, so if you get one bullet in the engine, the P-51 is probably going down. On the other hand, the P-47 couldn't fly quite as high or fast or far, but it had an air-cooled engine. You can put lots of bullets in the P-47 engine, and it will still get you home. So which is the plane you'd rather fly in combat? Al didn't answer the question, but when he put it that way, the Mustang pilot begrudgingly conceded that maybe the P-47 may have possibly had an edge over the P-51 Mustang in that one regard. The top American ace in World War II, which is someone who shoots down five enemy planes or more, was a guy with the unfortunate name Richard Bong. Here's a picture of Richard Bong with his girlfriend's picture on his P-38. Now, I would wager that almost none of you have ever heard of him. 
Richard Bong shot down 40 Japanese airplanes in the Pacific Theater, and he was what we call our ace of aces. No American shot down more enemy planes than he did. In World War I, we had Eddie Rickenbacker. He downed fewer enemy, but tends to be better known today. After downing 40 planes in World War II, Richard Bong was very famous. He was in the news all the time. When he reached 40, the U.S. War Department said, we better bring him home because if he's shot down and killed, it will be a big morale blow to the U.S. war effort. He was just that famous. They brought him home and he was test flying planes in Dayton, Ohio, and he test flew this very P-38 here. He was testing some new configurations for the engine. In one of his test flights, the right engine on this plane flamed out and he had to make an emergency landing at the airfield. He landed safely, but he was really mad. He said, of all the combat missions I flew, I never had to make an emergency landing. And now that I'm supposedly safe in Ohio, this is the closest I've come to crashing. And now for some ominous foreshadowing. He should have said it was the closest he had come to crashing so far. Richard Bong was killed test flying our very first fighter jet, the P-80. And when he was killed, because he was so famous, it was on the front page of all the newspapers. This is the New York Times here. But it wasn't the top story of the day, because the same day he was killed, August 6th, 1945, was the day we dropped the first atomic bomb on Japan. It's somewhat interesting that Richard Bong's name has mostly been lost to history because he is still America's top ace, and most likely he will always be our top ace because the way we fight now is very different from the way it was in the 1940s, and it's unlikely that any pilot will get a chance to shoot down more than 40 airplanes. If you've seen the two Top Gun movies, you'll remember that it took Maverick nearly 40 years just to get his five kills. Please pause the recording while you turn the corner and restart it when you are in front of the Enola Gay, the large silver B-29 Super Fortress bomber. When airplanes are developed, it takes a long time from initial design to construction to test flights before it becomes fully operational, except during war. During World War II, we needed better and better airplanes very quickly, so aircraft were designed, tested, and put into service in very short periods of time, often well before they were really ready, and that was the case with the B-29. The B-29 was the most advanced bomber we had in World War II. Before we had the B-29, we had bombers called the B-26, B-25, B-24, and the B-17, which all had limited range, limited speed, and could carry a very limited bomb payload. This was essentially okay for the European theater, where distances were relatively short, flying either from the UK and then later France against Germany. But in the Pacific, against the Japanese, the distances were much greater and those older bombers weren't really up to the task. They could not reach Japan from any of the air bases we had in the region, and if you're familiar with the Jimmy Doolittle raid right after Pearl Harbor, launching bombers from aircraft carriers was very dangerous and fairly inefficient, so a requirement went out for a long-range bomber, and the B-29, built by the Boeing Corporation, answered the call. It's the largest bomber we had. Physically, it could carry more weight, which means more fuel and more bombs, and of course, more fuel means that it can fly farther than any other bomber. It could fly higher. It was also the first pressurized bomber. Pressurized means that you could be flying at 30,000 feet, and you didn't need to have supplemental oxygen masks on. You didn't need to wear these big, heavy leather coats. This is a picture of a gunner in a B-17 bomber, unpressurized, with an oxygen mask and heavy coat because it might be 50 degrees below zero up at altitude. And here is a flight engineer in a pressurized B-29, no supplemental oxygen, flying in short sleeves. And it wasn't just a matter of being more comfortable, it meant that they were more efficient on longer missions. Some of the missions these bombers flew were 12 and 13 hours long. 
Again, it was a very advanced airplane, but it was rushed into service and there were a lot of issues with them initially. There were a lot of accidents when they were first put to use, mostly on takeoff. The biggest problem they had were with these four big engines. They were the largest engines at the time. They were 18-cylinder engines, which means that there was a row of nine cylinders and behind that, another row of nine cylinders. And they were air-cooled, which meant to keep the cylinders cool, you had to have air rushing through the relatively small opening in the front of the engine. Part of the engine mount, to make the engine even lighter, was made from magnesium. Magnesium is good for airplanes in that it is a very lightweight metal, but it is bad for airplanes because it is a metal that can burn. So I'll ask you this question. When are the engines working the hardest and getting the hottest? They are working the hardest when the engine is heaviest, fully loaded with fuel, fully loaded with bombs, and trying to climb on takeoff. And when is the least amount of air going through the engine? Yeah, you got it, at the very slow speeds when they are taking off and climbing. So on takeoff, the rear cylinders would overheat, the magnesium engine mounts would catch fire, and we had a lot of engine fires on takeoff. We lost more B-29s to takeoff accidents than we did to enemy fire when they first came into service, so it was a pretty big problem. Over time, they kept improving the B-29s, making them better, but initially they were very dangerous airplanes. Now after really emphasizing how dangerous the B-29s initially were, Al likes to tell this story. There were no women military pilots in World War II, but there was a group of women who were trained to fly military airplanes and would deliver them from the factory to the air bases. They were called Women Air Service Pilots, or the WASPs. Some of you have likely heard of the WASPs. They were pretty famous in their day. The WASPs flew each of the fighters and many of the bombers, but they did not fly the B-29, except for two women. Dora and Dorothea. Because this plane had such a reputation for takeoff accidents, a lot of the pilots who were converting from the other types of bombers to the B-29 didn't want to fly the B-29. They thought it was too dangerous. So the head of pilot training had an idea. He would train two wasps to fly the B-29. He would give them their own plane, which they named Ladybird, and Ladybird, with these two women flying, would be the lead plane when the B-29s were delivered from the factory to the air bases. The idea was, when the men saw the women in their airplane, it would shame them for being scared to fly the B-29. Now remember, this is 1945, it probably wouldn't happen today, but back then it, it worked and helped convince the men to fly the B-29. Even though the B-29 had issues when it came time to drop the atomic bomb, because that bomb was very heavy and because the distance was very great, they decided to use a B-29 for the atomic mission. To make the B-29 a little bit safer, they made several adjustments to it. So, Enola Gay, this plane here, is a modified B-29, modified for the atomic mission. At the time, we were flying B-29 raids against Japan with dozens, up to 100 or more airplanes at a time, flying in formation. For the atomic mission, there would be only three airplanes flying, so we didn't think they would run into any Japanese fighters in the air, which turned out to be true. And because they didn't expect any Japanese fighters, they took the guns off of an Gay. There was a gun on the plane's belly and another one on the top, and removing those saved a lot of weight, which made it fly a little faster and a little farther. The only gun left on the plane was in the tail, and the tail gunner just sat there at his post for the whole 13-hour mission with virtually nothing to do. He just looked out the window and took pictures. They made some adjustments to the engine to make them a little more reliable, and they took the armor plating off to save weight and made a few other small changes, so this is a modified B-29. The B-29s had two bomb bays. For this mission, the front bomb bay was adjusted for the very large atomic bomb, and since they didn't need to put any bombs in the second bomb bay, they put in an extra fuel tank to extend the range. For the atomic mission, we chose three targets in Japan. In priority order, those targets were first Hiroshima, 
It was the home of the Japanese army and it hadn't been bombed yet during the war. Second, Kokura, a city with munitions factories we wanted to take out. And third, Nagasaki, which also had munitions factories. So again, first Hiroshima, second Kokura, and third Nagasaki. Even though this advanced airplane had a radar, radar in 1945 was very primitive. It wasn't very accurate, and they wanted to be very precise when they dropped the first atomic bomb. So the rule was that the bombardier, who sat right in the big window in the nose of the plane, using the bomb sight, had to visually see the aim point when they dropped the bomb, which meant that it couldn't be covered with clouds. So before the mission against Hiroshima, three B-29 reconnaissance planes went out to fly over those three cities to see which one was clear of clouds. The plane that flew over Hiroshima reported that it was clear, and since it was priority number one, they decided to go against that target. The night before the mission, the bomb was loaded in the front bomb bay. The bomb was so big it didn't fit under the airplane, and they had to have a pit dug in the tarmac where they put the bomb, rolled Enola Gay over the pit, and then lifted the bomb up into the plane. After the bomb was loaded, the name Enola Gay was painted on the aircraft. Up until that point, it was simply known as Plane 82. Many pilots named their planes for their wives or girlfriends. Colonel Paul Tibbetts decided to name this plane after his mother, Enola Gay Tibbetts. I don't know if he asked her permission first, but after the mission, she became one of the most famous or infamous women of World War II. But she looks happy enough. Before Enola Gay took off, another B-29 took off from their base on Tinian Island in the Pacific and flew halfway to Japan, then landed on Iwo Jima. The thought was, if Enola Gay ran into any of the common problems seen in the rest of the B-29 fleet, it could land at Iwo Jima, transfer the bomb, and still complete the mission. And then Enola Gay took off, along with two other B-29s, one carrying cameras to take pictures of the mushroom cloud, and the other carrying sensors to drop and measure the radiation. They didn't take off with the bomb arm because, again, of the B-29's reputation for takeoff accidents. They didn't want to have an accident with a live atomic bomb. After they got airborne, the weapons officer crawled into the bomb bay and pulled the plugs on the bomb to arm it. They didn't run into any Japanese fire on the way to their target. They got over the city of Hiroshima, the bombardier saw the aim point, and they dropped the bomb. They dropped it from about 30,000 feet, and as soon as it was away, they made a diving turn, then gunned the engines. They wanted to get as far away as possible. This type of bomb had not been tested before. They didn't know how big the blast would be. The bomb fell from 30,000 feet to about 1,800 feet above the city, where it detonated. It was decided to detonate above the ground for greatest effect. Despite their attempts to get out of the area as fast as they could, shockwaves from the blast did hit Enola Gay, and a second blast echoed, bounced off the ground, and hit them a second time. It didn't do any real damage to the plane, and they made it back to their base, and of course, as we know, the city was destroyed. The Japanese did not surrender after the first atomic mission, so a second mission was planned, and that mission was planned to go against the city of Kokura, which was now the number one priority target. Enola Gay did not carry the bomb on the second atomic mission. It was the weather reconnaissance plane that flew over the city of Kokura and reported back that Kokura was clear of clouds. So the plane with the bomb took off and flew to Kokura, in the time between Enola Gay calling in the all-clear and the plane with the bomb arriving on station, some smoke from a conventional bombing raid further north had drifted over the city and the bombardier could not see the aim point. They made several passes over the city before finally deciding to go on to the alternate target site, which was Nagasaki, and drop the bomb there. And that is why today, I will say that Kokura is the luckiest city in Japan, and Nagasaki the unluckiest. And then the Japanese surrendered and the war was over. Enola Gay flew a couple of post-war atomic tests in the Pacific, and then it was retired and put into storage. 
The Smithsonian had it in storage for many, many years until there was a museum large enough to display it. More hours were put into restoring Enola Gay than it took to build it in the first place. It was a complete restoration. Everything inside and outside the airplane is exactly like it was back in 1945. Interestingly, when they were doing the restoration, they found the arming plugs for the atomic bomb on the floor of the plane, which are on display in one of the cabinets over by the SR-71. However, it's impossible to know for sure if they are the plugs from the Hiroshima mission or one of the post-war tests, but it was still an interesting and unexpected discovery. The B-29s were also used for reconnaissance purposes. They were called RB-29s. Instead of bombs and guns, they carried cameras and were used all the way into the Korean War as reconnaissance platforms. One little interesting footnote, a big part of intelligence is material exploitation. The Soviet Union did not declare war on Japan until after we bombed Hiroshima. But before that time, we had three B-29s that carried out bombing raids, regular conventional bombing raids, against Japan, that were damaged and had to make emergency landings in the far east of Russia. And because at that point the Soviets were still neutral, they didn't give the airplanes or even the crews back to the United States. The crews had to wait out the war before they were returned, and the Soviets never returned the airplanes. They examined them, took them apart, and reverse engineered them, and then built their own version of the B-29 called the Tu-2. Here's a picture of the Tu-2, essentially a Soviet B-29, and they put them into production as exact copies of the American B-29, which was a bit of a feat in and of itself since the B-29s were made with imperial measurements and the Soviets used the metric system. For a while, the only two planes capable of carrying an atomic bomb were the American B-29 and the Soviet copy of the B-29, so again, Material exploitation and industrial espionage are big deals and important parts of military capabilities and intelligence. Possibly the funniest part of the Tu-2 story is that the B-29 the Soviets disassembled to reverse engineer was copied so exactly that every Tu-2 had a rivet hole in one wing exactly where an unknown Boeing worker mistakenly drilled in the B-29 that the Soviets used for a template. Now let's turn around and talk about this aircraft here. By the end of World War II, we had jets. The Germans were the first to put jets into service, then after the war we had jets in the U.S., but we didn't have any jet airliners, and on the military side, we didn't have any jet refuelers, no jet tankers. Air-to-air -air refueling came about right after World War II, but the only way to refuel the big jets like the B-52 bomber in this picture wasn't very practical, because the tankers had to go full throttle and fly as fast as they absolutely could, while the jets had to fly just above the speed in which their engines would stall and even that was almost too fast for the propeller tankers going all out. The Boeing Corporation lost a lot of their military business when the war ended, and they thought there would be a big market for a jet airliner to replace commercial propeller planes, and that there would be a big market for a jet tanker. But when they shopped those ideas around looking for investors, everyone said no. The airlines were happy flying propeller planes like the Constellation down the aisle a ways, and they didn't want to spend any money on a jet upgrade, and the military said no, the war's over, and our budget has been cut, and we don't want to invest in a jet tanker. Despite this rejection, Boeing still believed that there was a market for them, so they built this airplane here as a technology demonstrator to demonstrate to the airlines the value of having a jet airliner, and to demonstrate to the military the value of having a jet tanker. Boeing spent about $15 million developing the Boeing 357-80, usually shortened to just Dash 80. They built it in secret, and back then $15 million was a lot of money for Boeing. If the Dash 80 didn't sell to either the military or the airlines, Boeing was going to go bankrupt. 
after putting all of their eggs in this one giant basket to market it to the airlines, Bill Allen, the head of Boeing at the time, invited all the airline executives out to Seattle for a meeting. He held the meeting outdoors, always a gamble in Seattle, and he told his chief test pilot, a guy called Tex Johnston, to fly this demonstrator over the airline executives at a low altitude, about 800 feet, so they could see the Dash 80 in action, hoping they would be impressed and that it would help sell the airplane. Tex Johnston, well, he was a real hotshot test pilot, and he thought to sell the airplane, he needed to do something better than just fly over the airline executives. So as he's flying over the meeting, he does a barrel roll over the group, turns the plane around, and barrel rolls over them again. This is a picture that somebody inside the plane took. You can see the engines are above the wing in this photo, but below the wing on the actual aircraft right here in front of you. He didn't tell anybody that he was going to do this, so I don't know what the onboard photographer was thinking when he took the picture. He could have been thinking it would be the last picture he ever took, but Tex did this barrel roll twice. Bill Allen, the head of Boeing, was furious. He said, what's with this hotshot pilot doing aerobatics in my airplane? If he crashes, we're going to go bankrupt. He told his aide that was there with him he wanted Tex fired on the spot. And the aide said, you can't fire Tex. He's the only one qualified to fly the Dash 80. So when Tex landed, he was called to see Bill Allen, and Allen erupted. What the hell do you think you're doing? Very calmly, Tex replied, I'm selling airplanes, boss. Tex then explained that a barrel roll is called a 1G maneuver, meaning that if you do it properly, it doesn't put any excess stress on the airplane, which is true. But it's still very impressive to do in a big plane like the Dash 80 at 800 feet. So Alan took a few breaths and said, okay, you know that and I know that, now don't ever do that again. And after the incident, strict company policies were put into place and no other Boeing plane was ever barrel rolled. The airline executives were completely impressed with the plane and the barrel roll wasn't the only reason, but it helped. They all put in orders for the Dash 80 and it is the plane that became the 707. And the 707 is the predecessor of all jet airliners today. All the Boeing airliners, all the Airbus airliners, they still look like this airplane here. They have better color schemes. I think after spending all that money building the Dash 80, these were the only colors Boeing could afford. But they are all based on the Dash 80 here. So the Smithsonian says this is the most significant jet in airline history. On the military side, the same thing was true. They demonstrated this to the military, minus the barrel rolls, as a tanker. The military was so impressed, they placed orders for the tanker that became the KC-135. And they're still flying the KC-135 today as tankers for the fleet some 70 years later. The Dash 80 is the airplane that saved Boeing and is, again, one of the most significant airplanes here at the museum. From an intelligence perspective, the 135 model, based on the Dash 80, has spawned several reconnaissance variants, including the J-Star, which provides commanders with ground surveillance in support of targeting and attack operations, Cobra Ball, which is the Massent Collector, and Rivet Joint, which is the Sigint Collector. So again, this airplane has had a major effect on commercial and military aviation. Now, if you look down the aisle a ways, you'll see a funny-looking plane with really small windows. That is the Concorde, which was a joint project developed and built by the British and the French. Both British and French test pilots said that they barrel-rolled the Concorde, and though no physical evidence like a photograph exists of the stunt, Al, who had the chance to speak to one of the pilots who said he barrel-rolled the plane, absolutely believes him. Anyway, here's the Concorde, which has no military application whatsoever. It was developed strictly as a commercial plane, but there is an interesting tidbit about it from an intelligence perspective. For the most part, it was built out in the open. Again, it was built by the French and the British jointly. In fact, some people say that the most amazing thing about the Concorde wasn't how fast it flew or how high it flew, it was the fact that the British and the French could get along well enough to build the airplane together. 
But the head of the Soviet airline Aeroflot in Toulouse, France, at the time the Concorde was being built, was a KGB agent, and he had recruited lots of people in the Concorde factory to collect sensitive information about the building of the jet. Same thing in England. When the Concorde was being built, the KGB had agents in the British factory too. When the Soviets revealed their version of the supersonic airliner, by coincidence I'm sure, it looked so much like the Concorde that the West dubbed it the Concordski. So again, we have another example of reverse engineering and industrial espionage. And just because you have the plans for a sophisticated aircraft, it doesn't mean that you have the material or the engineering know-how to build a good replica. The Concordski was not nearly as good a plane as the Concorde. There were several accidents. In fact, they didn't fly many passenger flights because it was so dangerous. It was mostly used as a really fast cargo plane. Now we're going to move on to the other side of the Enola Gay and finish talking about aviation innovations of World War II, looking at some remarkable planes the Axes had. Please pause this presentation until you are at the Aichi M6A Seiran, and as you walk that way, you will pass by the P-47 Thunderbolt, the air-cooled engine fighter mentioned earlier that could take a lot of rounds to the engine and still make it home. The Seiran is the only Japanese plane we're going to highlight. Its name means Clear Sky Storm, and it was probably the most secret of the Japanese secret weapons in World War II. Our secret weapon was the atomic bomb, so looking at the Seiran, you might be thinking, why would this be a secret weapon? Well, the Japanese, unbeknownst to us, had built two submarines that were more than twice as big as any other submarine at the time, just monster-sized subs. And on the deck of these submarines was a watertight tube that you could fit three folded Seirons into. On these planes, the pontoons come off, the wings fold up, and the very tip of the tail folds down, and that's how they would fit into the tube. The idea was they have these very big submarine aircraft carriers. They could take these subs and sneak up on the Panama Canal and then launch bombing missions against the Panama Canal and keep American ships from getting into the Pacific. Fortunately for us, they were developing these things with a lot of secrecy, which really slowed down production. And by the time they were ready to be used operationally in 1943, U.S. ships were already in the Pacific. So the Panama Canal mission was scrapped, and the first operational mission these were actually deployed on was to attack the American fleet in 1945 that was gathering for the invasion of Japan. Of course, the atomic missions were top secret. Most people, even most senior military officers, didn't know we were going to use atomic bombs, so they were planning for the invasion of mainland Japan. The Seiran were meant to sink as many of the 15 American aircraft carriers gathering for that invasion as they could. From an intelligence perspective, it's kind of interesting because we didn't know about these submarines or their aircraft until after the war when we captured them. The subs were built at these dockyards in Japan that were being bombed regularly by the Army Air Corps. Before we bombed them, we'd send the reconnaissance planes over to take pictures, and then after we bombed them, we sent the reconnaissance planes over again to do the battle damage assessment. And yet, we never detected these giant-sized submarines being built. Being an intelligence professional himself, Al hates the term intelligence failure, but he does admit that it is interesting that we never saw these giant subs under construction. Their first operational mission, to fly against the American fleet that was gathering for the invasion of Japan, was planned for what turned out to be the day after Japan surrendered. So when the surrender came, the mission was canceled. The plan had been to have a bomb under each plane, drop the bomb, and then kamikaze the plane into the ships. Instead, after the surrender, the Japanese submariners took the six planes loaded into the two submarines and threw them overboard, and then surrendered the submarines to the U.S. forces. The first time we knew anything about these subs was when they were surrendered to us. The only reason we have this airplane here in the museum, 
which is the only Seiran left in the world, is because it was still back at the factory when Japan surrendered. After the surrender, we took the two submarines back to Pearl Harbor to exploit them at the end of the war, to see how the Japanese made such a giant submarine, and then after we finished exploiting them, the Soviets, who were now our allies against Japan, said they wanted the submarines to exploit themselves. And again, we see how material exploitation is so important. We didn't want to give the submarines to the Soviets, we didn't trust them, so rather than hand them over, we sank the submarines in the Pacific off of Hawaii instead. A secret weapon doesn't have to be a technological marvel, it could just be in the tactics they use to sneak up on us and attack us. On the other side of the coin, if you turn around, the Germans' secret weapons were what they called their wonder weapons. The Germans, despite being in bad shape at the end of the war, kept developing more and more advanced weapons. This airplane here is called the Hinkle 219 Uhu. It was a German night fighter, and its name means Eagle Owl. It was built to fly at night, so the bottom is black, and when you're looking up, the black is against the dark sky. The top is camouflaged, so when you're looking down, you can't see it. It had guns on the back pointed upwards to shoot at the bombers it was flying directly under, and it had a radar in the nose so it could detect incoming bombers. It was a pretty advanced plane for the time, but it came very late in the war and had no real effect on the Allied war effort. The next plane is the 234 Blitz, which means lightning, and it was the world's first jet bomber. The Germans had the world's first jet fighter, which we don't have a copy of here at the museum, and then they had this jet bomber. It didn't work very well as a bomber because it flew so fast. It only carried one bomb, where you see the B-29 carrying dozens of bombs. It had a crew of one, the B-29 had a crew of 12 or 13, and this one pilot here was the pilot, the navigator, the bombardier, the gunner. You see the periscope up front? He could use that to watch for fighters coming up on his six and operate the tail gun, in theory. This one pilot had to do everything and was so busy that it was too difficult to put that one bomb, which was a good old-fashioned dumb bomb, not a smart bomb by any means, on target. It had no effect as a bomber, but it was very effective as a reconnaissance airplane. They could put cameras on the belly instead of bombs, and they could fly faster than any of our planes, so we couldn't shoot them down. And they could take pretty good pictures and gather good intelligence. But like the night fighter, it came very late in the war. Its first operational flight was in August 1944, which was two months after D-Day, so the Allies were well on the European continent by then. One final fact about this aircraft, under each wing next to the engine, You'll see what looks like a smaller engine with a lot of cloth packed in front of it. To help these planes take off on shorter runways, they were equipped with rocket boosters that, once airborne, would drop off the plane and parachute back to the ground. These boosters would then be collected and reused. Maintenance was a major problem with the engines on this plane. Jets were still new and jet engines were not very efficient at the time. These engines had a lot of moving parts and had to be completely rebuilt after only 10 hours of flying. This was also the same engine that the German jet fighter used, and there weren't a ton of engines, so the fighters got most of the few that were available. This next plane, the twin turbine Dorner Fiel, which means arrow in German, is even bigger and faster than the jet bomber, though it's a propeller plane. Most twin-engine planes have their propellers in the wings. You can see that this one has one in the nose and one in the tail. It was the second fastest fighter in the war, but it came too late and wasn't even in use when the war ended. After victory in Europe, the Allies wanted to get one of these unique twin-engine planes back to England for exploitation, but there were no Allied pilots who had any idea how to fly the one we had captured. There happened to be a large number of German POWs nearby, so we asked around and found the plane's pilot, who agreed to fly it to England. We told him we were going to send two or three armed fighter escorts and wouldn't hesitate to shoot him down if he tried anything funny, and after that, off they all went to the UK, 
As soon as they were airborne, the German pilot went full throttle, and before the escorts knew what was happening, they had been left in the dust and the German was long gone. But the German pilot had nowhere else to go. He just wanted to show the Allies what his plane could do, so when the escorts finally arrived at the airfield in England, the German was there waiting for them. He had been waiting for about 20 or 30 minutes. With this plane's unique propeller placement, you might think that no pilot would want to eject from it, fearing they would hit the rear propeller and really ruin their day. The Germans did value their trained pilots' lives more than the aircraft they flew, so they installed explosive bolts in the tail, so if a pilot did have to bail out, the rear propeller could be blown off first and any ejecting pilot wouldn't have to worry about it. This plane was given to the Smithsonian, where it stayed in storage next to Enola Gay for many years until they decided to restore it. We shipped it back to the German factory that had originally built it, and when they started the restoration, they realized the explosive bolts were still in the tail and still live, so they had to call in EOD to dispose of them. We had no idea about the bolts when the plane was put into storage and are very glad they didn't go off during all that time the plane spent next to an Gay. So again, the Japanese had a very simple design for their secret weapon. We had the atomic bomb as ours and the Germans kept developing better and better technology. Though some people say that if they had spent their resources developing more traditional weapons, the Germans might have done better. So I for one am glad they poured so much into these highly technical, but mostly ineffective so-called wonder weapons. We are now going to take a look at one more German wonder plane that is on display behind the SR-71 at the entrance to the space gallery. As you walk over there, remember to look for the sad skunkwork skunk on the SR-71 tail that I mentioned earlier. Please pause this recording until you are at the Messerschmitt Comet. As unlikely as it seems, this small plane was the fastest airplane in the world at the end of World War II, and the Germans were so short on resources in 1945 that it is made out of plywood. That's not rust you can see on the leading edge of the wings, that is the plywood showing through. Keeping with our theme of capturing as much German and Japanese tech as we could for material exploitation, we brought this plane back to the U.S., but it was so dangerous to fly that we only ever flew it as a glider and never tried out its powered flight. The reason it could fly so fast, and part of the reason it was so dangerous, is that this is a rocket plane. It's not a jet, and it's not a propeller plane. That little propeller you see on the nose would just spin in the wind and power the generator that made electricity for the radio. This was a fighter. There were guns in the wings, and it would fly almost 600 miles per hour. Some reports put it as faster than 600 miles per hour. Either way, it was much faster than anything else at the time, but it had no effect on the war and also proves the value of indications and warnings intelligence. This rocket engine only had enough fuel to stay lit for 8 minutes, so the way they used the Comet was to preposition these fighters where they expected the American and British bomber raids to fly over. If the raids flew over somewhere else, they couldn't be used. If they got word that the bombers were coming, the German pilots would jump into their planes, start the rocket engines, zoom almost straight up to a high altitude, and then attack the bombers. But the planes flew so fast and their guns fired so slowly, they would only get one or two shots off before they were past the bombers, and then they would run out of fuel and have to glide to a landing. They could glide very well, but you see the wheels on the plane? They stayed on the ground after the plane took off, so gliding back to Earth, they had to land in a grassy field on skids. Oftentimes, the fields were not perfectly flat or level, and the skids would get caught on something, the plane would flip over, and the pilot would get injured. There were a lot of back injuries as a result of less-than-perfect landings. They only shot down seven B-17 bombers, and they lost a lot more of their own planes to accidents. Again, an advanced design with advanced technology, but it had no effect on the war. We are now going to move over to the Cold War gallery on the other side of the SR-71 and start off over there with the Korean War. 
please pause the recording until you are over at the MiG-15. The Korean War kicked off in 1950. Typically, after a major war, World War I, World War II, what have you, countries made big cuts to their defense budgets because the militaries didn't need to spend the same amount of money in peacetime as they did in wartime. After 1945, the U.S. made major cuts to its defense budget. We were developing jets, but were now making slow progress due to the budget cuts. In the early days of the Korean War, we were flying the same planes we had used in World War II, the Corsair, the P-40, P-51, P-47, P-38, and so on. We were using propeller planes in Korea. The primary bomber was still the B-29. The primary reconnaissance plane was still the RB-29, and intelligence-wise, we knew that the Soviets were developing a jet, but we assessed that they were far from being ready to deploy it. Then one day, early in the war, our B-29s were very surprised to have a MiG-15 fly into their formation and start shooting them down. It caught our intelligence analysts completely unaware. We didn't think they had an operational jet fighter. The surprise was a huge problem. We were not ready for it at all, we had no defense against it, and we had to change our bombing strategy. Instead of continuing low to mid-level daylight bombing raids against North Korea like we had been doing since the war started, we had to shift to high-altitude nighttime bombing which was much less effective. We also had to rush the F-86 into production much quicker than we thought we would. So why did we miss the call on the MiG-15? We assessed that based on all the German technology they had acquired after World War II, the Soviets had an airframe, but they were far from developing a jet engine. It turns out that our assessment was spot on. Our intel analysts were right, so what happened? The British had developed a jet engine with Rolls-Royce called the Neen, and they were displaying it at an air show, and the Russians came to the show and said, hey, we would like to purchase a Neen engine. The British said, well, we'll sell it to you under one condition, that you promise not to use it for military purposes. And the Russians said, we promise not to use it for military purposes. If the Brits had looked a little closer, they may have seen the Russians put one hand behind their backs and cross their fingers, which, as we all know from our days in elementary school, absolved them from any promise they were making. The Russians got the Neen engine and immediately went to work doing what they do best, material exploitation and reverse engineering. And they developed their own version of the Neen engine. They put it into production and were soon producing a lot of MiG-15s. From a military capability standpoint, it's interesting to look at the different approaches that the Soviets took with the MiG-15 and the U.S. took with the F-86 here. The Russians used a very simple design that could fly fast and climb high. It had a pressurized cockpit, a strong cannon in the nose, a very simple gun sight, and very limited avionics inside. The way they would deploy these is that the ground controller would direct the pilots where to go and even direct the pilots when to fire. The Americans built a much more capable fighter. The F-86 is a more complicated airplane. It has the slats on the leading edge of the wings, so it could make really tight turns at low speeds. It has a much more sophisticated gun sight and more advanced avionics. The U.S. pilots also had a lot more autonomy than the Soviet pilots. This goes back to what we have already talked about with the two schools of doctrine. The Soviets had doctrine as a hard and fast rulebook philosophy, while the U.S. treats doctrine as a guidebook to aid in decision-making on the battlefield, but not to act like a checklist where everything has to be ticked off. Again, the MiG-15 was simple, fast, they made a lot of them and rigidly controlled them, versus the F-86, which was more complicated, more maneuverable, they didn't make as many, but they gave the pilots more autonomy. So which one was better? Well, the kill ratio was better for the F-86 than the MiG-15, which tends to be the only metric that really matters in wartime, but the MiG-15 was still a pretty successful fighter in its own right. It was the same theory in Vietnam. If you'll turn around, this is the MiG-21. A very simple design, very fast, but it was the same doctrine that they had with the MiG-15. They produced a lot of them, though the Soviets only gave a limited number to the North Vietnamese and several countries still use this fighter today. 
In Vietnam, essentially they were directed by the ground controller, whereas the F-4 Phantom, the primary American fighter in Vietnam, was built around a sophisticated radar in its nose and built around air-to-air missiles. The thinking was that if you have a state-of-the-art radar and really good air-to-air missiles like the AIM-7 Sparrow that you can see on the far side of the F-4, you didn't even need to get into a dogfight. You could stay far off, detect the bad guys from far away, fire the missiles, and shoot down the bogeys before they even saw you. Again, different doctrinal philosophies. The U.S. philosophy sounded like a good idea, but what they didn't count on is that sometimes the missiles miss. And when the missiles miss and you get close, then what happens? If you don't have any guns, how are you going to dogfight against the MiG-21? The F-4 was used by the Navy and the Marines and the Air Force, and the Air Force decided to put guns on them. The Navy never did. In terms of material exploitation, one more example. We sold F-86s to the Republic of China, to Taiwan. We had also sold them these capable air-to-air missiles. During the second Taiwan Strait Crisis in 1958, a Taiwanese F-86 fired a Sparrow missile into a People's Republic of China MiG-17, the MiG that came between the one in Korea and the one in Vietnam. The Sparrow hit the MiG, but it did not detonate. It stuck in the tail, and the PRC pilot was able to fly home and land with a missile sticking out of his plane. I'm not sure what he was thinking about during the return flight, and I imagine he had to change his flight suit as soon as he got back, but he landed safely, the Chinese carefully removed the missile, and they gave it to the Russians. The Russians reverse-engineered the missile, and they developed the Atoll, which today is the most produced air-to-air missile ever made, and is almost an exact copy of the American-made Sparrow missile. If you will look up above you, you will see a Predator drone. The Predator was a reconnaissance vehicle. It had a couple of different sensors on it, an electro-optical sensor, an infrared sensor, it could fly very high, and it could stay in the air for about 24 hours. It was an extremely successful intelligence collector you get real-time intelligence that is digitally returned and quickly exploitable by analysts and operators, and it was used extensively. After 9-11, we deployed the Predators to Afghanistan while we were looking for bin Laden. Al has a personal story about this time and mentions that this was very frustrating work. He was working at CIA at the time, and they would get live feeds and see Al-Qaeda targets or Taliban targets. They would give the coordinates of these targets to the Air Force or the Navy, but by the time an F-15 or a cruise missile got there, the targets were gone. Together with the Air Force, the CIA said, let's develop a program to put weapons on the Predator, and they converted Hellfire anti-tank missiles to fly on these drones. This particular drone in the museum was the very first one that did the test firing of the missiles at the Proving Grounds in Nevada and it was also the first one deployed to Afghanistan with the Hellfire missiles on it. But here's a lesson learned out of this program. It's not just the technology that's important, you also have to have the right command and control procedures in place. We had a very capable platform that could spot a target and that could attack a target in real time, but we didn't have the procedures down on who had the authority to fire the missile. From your C2 lesson... They didn't know exactly who the missiles were opcon to. The first time a missile was fired operationally from this predator here, the CIA saw Mullah Omar, who was the head of the Taliban. They saw his caravan right outside Kabul. They saw him go into a building. The CIA asked for authority to fire the missile. Because the Air Force was flying the predator, they were controlling it from a van at CIA headquarters, the CIA didn't think they had the authority to shoot the missile. This may be the only time in history that CIA assumed they didn't have the authority to do something. The pilot flying the drone wanted orders before firing, and it was now unclear if the release authority would come from the Pentagon, from CENTCOM down in Florida, from CENTCOM forward in Riyadh, or come from the local commander in Afghanistan. And by the time they figured it out and fired the missile, Mullah Omar was gone. So the very first time a Predator Hellfire was used in Afghanistan, it missed the target. 
But they got the C2 question straightened out and it was used very effectively throughout Afghanistan and also in the Iraq War, and they are still being used today. The last thing we're going to look at here in the Cold War gallery is a plane that came well after the Cold War ended. Please pause this recording and move down to the X-35. The last time that the Air Force, Navy, and Marine Corps all used the same fighter was in Vietnam with the previously mentioned F-4. Because of their divergent missions, it is difficult for all three of those services to agree on the same airframe. With that said, when it came time to develop an advanced stealth fighter to replace our two previously built advanced stealth fighters, all three services got involved with the design process so that everyone got what they needed in a single aircraft. I'm not going to get into how much longer it took to develop the F-35 or how astronomically over budget the program ran, but I will say that the F-35 is currently being delivered to the U.S. military and to allied militaries who helped with its development. The U.S. military has three configurations of the F-35 that are all a little bit different. The F-35 Alpha is used by the Air Force and most foreign militaries. It is equipped with guns, so if needed, the pilots can dogfight. The F-35 Bravo is operated by the Marine Corps, the UK, and Italy. It can take off from very short runways, allowing it to operate from austere short field bases in a wide range of aircraft-capable ships. It can also land vertically like the Harrier could. The final configuration, the F-35 Charlie, is used exclusively by the U.S. Navy. It was designed to operate from an aircraft carrier and has a much longer range than other configurations, making it, at the time of this recording, the world's only fifth-generation long-range stealth strike fighter. This aircraft here, the X-35, was the technology demonstrator for all three military variants. During one test flight, it became the first aircraft in history to achieve a short takeoff, go supersonic, and then land vertically in a single flight. Those three records are why it has the three aces on its tail. We are now going to move on to the space gallery. Please pause this recording until you are in front of the space shuttle. There were five space shuttles built, plus a tester that was never flown outside of Earth's atmosphere, but was used for glide landing tests. While the shuttles were still in service, that demonstrator, the Enterprise, was displayed here, but the museum upgraded to a space-flown shuttle when the fleet was retired. Of the five shuttles flown in space, there are three left. We lost two to accidents. When the space shuttle stopped flying, the Smithsonian got first dibs and said, We want this one. We want Discovery. Because Discovery flew more missions and spent more time in space than any of the other shuttles. It flew 39 of the 135 shuttle missions. It spent a full year, 365 days in space between all those missions. The shuttle was our first reusable space vehicle and the first crewed space vehicle that would land on wheels. When it was designed, it was designed and built to bring lots of different satellites into orbit, to bring the Hubble Space Telescope into orbit, but also to be used for reconnaissance satellites. So when the space shuttle was being designed, the NRO, the National Reconnaissance Organization, said that NASA had to increase the size of the cargo bay because the reconnaissance satellites are larger than communication satellites, and the NRO levied a requirement on NASA, and NASA increased the size of the cargo bay so it could take recon satellites and other DoD payloads into space as well. Discovery did fly three or four classified missions, but ironically, after we lost the second shuttle, we lost Challenger in 1986 and Columbia in 2003, after we lost Columbia, DOD and the NRO said, we don't want to risk our expensive satellites on the space shuttle anymore, so they returned to launching them on traditional rockets rather than with shuttles. The space shuttle is a remarkable space vehicle. Aside from taking up the Hubble, it was used to build the International Space Station, 
We couldn't have built the space station if we didn't have a shuttle to bring the parts up. Again, it is an amazing vehicle, but it has a mixed legacy because we lost 14 astronauts during the program. After losing a total of three astronauts during the previous three NASA space programs. Before the shuttle, we had these capsules that you can see to the left of the shuttle. The first six Americans in space flew in single-seat Mercury capsules. One small capsule would go up, circle the Earth a few times, and then come back down. They didn't really do much, they were just to see if we could get a person into space. And if you will direct your attention to the wall that is possibly behind you, I'm a recording after all, so I have no idea which direction you are actually facing, you can see an Army Redstone rocket. The Redstone was a purpose-built intercontinental ballistic missile designed to carry nukes, but it was also the missile NASA used to launch the Mercury capsules into space. The next program also used ICBMs to put astronauts into orbit, and it wouldn't be until the Apollo program, when the largest rocket ever built, the Saturn V, was designed as a space launch vehicle and not an ICBM. The next space program used a larger two-seat capsule called Gemini. Well, if you talk to Al, he calls it Gemini because back in the day, NASA put out a press release that it was pronounced Gemini, and while I recognize that decision, in the words of Nick Fury, I think it's a stupid decision, so I'm going to pronounce Gemini like most of the rest of the world. Sorry, Al. Gemini was testing if we could live in space for longer periods of time and conduct some complicated rendezvous and docking maneuvers that would be necessary to perfect before attempting a lunar landing. While this was going on, the Air Force thought, hey, we could also use a Gemini capsule to put a manned reconnaissance capability into space. So the Air Force built something called the Manned Orbital Laboratory. There was a Gemini capsule at the very top and then several cameras to take really good pictures from space. We thought we needed to have a photographer up there taking the pictures. There was a door so the photographer could leave the Gemini capsule portion of the lab, enter the camera space, and take pictures from space but it turned out to be a very complicated program and it was cancelled before it was launched. Some of the astronauts that were set to become spies in space became NASA astronauts and flew the space shuttle. So instead of having manned reconnaissance capability in space, we had satellites. One particularly effective satellite was the Corona that we will get to in a few minutes. The space shuttle also flew the mission which launched the space topography satellite which you can see up above you. That was a joint mission between NASA and NEMA, the National Imagery and Mapping Agency at the time, which is now NGA. This satellite was used to create the first topographical maps of the entire Earth. It was carried inside the cargo bay of the shuttle, and after getting into orbit, the very long extension you see was deployed, and it could take stereo pictures of the Earth, which were turned into a 3D map. A lower resolution version was used by NASA for all the GPS systems that we now use, including commercial GPS, and the higher resolution map was used by NRO, the rest of the intelligence community, and the military when higher resolution images were needed. The higher resolution images from the mission have still not been released. In World War II and into the 1950s, we thought we could use unmanned aircraft in different ways. The Regulus was the first Navy cruise missile. As you can see, it is a very large missile with a jet engine inside and a rocket engine on either side. It could be launched off of ships, but it had to be surface ships, and it was not very accurate. The Air Force developed launched cruise missiles that could fly long distances and were essentially flying bombs. And then the Navy developed the Poseidon that could launch from a submerged submarine. Today, submarine-launched nuclear ballistic missiles are still a vital part of our nuclear deterrence triad, along with silo-based surface-to-surface nuclear missiles and air-launched nuclear missiles. If you ever make it over to the Cold War Gallery at the Navy Museum on the Washington Navy Yard, they have a Poseidon missile in that building's lobby, and it may be my favorite piece at that museum. Not for any historical value it has, but because near the tip of the missile is a small green, unclassified sticker. 
just in case you were wondering what the classification level of the display was. Along the same lines as that unclassified sticker, the next missile we're going to talk about is the one with the big inert sign on it. So if you're worried, no, this one isn't going to go off on us. I joke, but I suppose after the story of the German plane with the live explosive bolts in it, double checking that something is inert isn't a bad idea. The Air Force designed this anti-satellite missile to be launched off of an F-15 fighter. The way that would work is that an F-15 would fly almost straight up, as fast as it could. Up at a very high altitude, it would release the missile, the missile's rocket engine would light, and off it would go into space to shoot down a satellite. It was tested once. There was a weather satellite that was on its last legs. It still had a little bit of life left, but it was almost dead, and so the Air Force thought it would be a good idea to test the missile out by shooting down that weather satellite. They conducted the test, and they were successful. They shot down that satellite, and in the process, they pissed everybody off. They pissed off the people that were operating the satellite, because even though it was on its last legs, it was still recording data, and they didn't appreciate having the Air Force shoot that satellite down, especially since the Air Force did it without asking permission. And as you might imagine, NASA and the space community got very upset because now all the debris from the exploded satellite has just been added to all the space junk already orbiting Earth that can put our operational satellites in danger. So after getting its wrist slapped, the Air Force hasn't tested another anti-satellite missile. Now we're going to move to the back of the space gallery to the final stop on this tour. Please pause this recording until you get to the Corona satellite. Going back to the very first aircraft we talked about on this tour, the SR-71, we were very concerned about the Soviet military threat, in particular the Soviet nuclear threat. We didn't know how many surface-to-surface -surface nuclear missiles the Soviets had, we didn't know how many strategic bombers they had, and our intelligence collection capability against the Soviets was pretty limited. And that's when I said the CIA contracted with Lockheed to build the U-2 that I spoke about, and I also mentioned that by 1960, the CIA had two programs planned to replace the U-2. The first was the SR-71, and the second was this Corona satellite. In 1956, the Soviets launched the world's first artificial satellite, Sputnik. There is a model of Sputnik on the far side of Discovery with a bunch of other early satellites, but Sputnik was basically a little ball that just circled the Earth. It did nothing but circle the Earth, and if you had a shortwave radio, you could hear it beeping. It didn't do anything else, but it was an amazing technical achievement for the day. After Sputnik, CIA thought, what we need to do is put something in space that will orbit the Earth and will actually do something. We need to put a camera in space with a really good lens that can take pictures of different spots on the Earth. That is probably an even more audacious idea than trying to build a replacement aircraft for the U-2. But then again, no one has ever accused the CIA of thinking too small. When the Soviets put up Sputnik, it really didn't matter what the altitude was or what its orbit was. All it had to do was circle the Earth and beep. What we were building, this really sensitive camera that would take really good pictures, had to be placed in a specific spot in space, and then we had to know exactly where it was pointing to take pictures. Because this was the pre-digital age, we also had to get the film back to Earth. So, yeah, it was pretty remarkable that they even thought about doing that. Forget that they were able to achieve it. CIA built a program called Corona. Its cover name was Discovery, and it was a camera inside the nose of a rocket like the one on the back wall here an Agena rocket. Inside the Agena was a camera and a film canister like this metal orb here. Once all the film was used in one of the canisters, it was ejected from the Agena, fell back through the atmosphere, and then an airplane had to fly by and snag it out of the air so we could develop the film and have good pictures. We test flew it 12 times and there were 12 launches and 12 failures. And finally, on the 13th attempt, lucky number 13, we were able to recover an empty canister. 
A week after that successful test, Corona 14 was launched with an actual camera and film. And that was the first time we had a space-based intelligence capability. From 1960 to 1972, we flew more than 100 Corona missions that took more than 800,000 photographs. The film recovered from Corona 14 covered more Soviet territory than all the earlier U-2 flights combined, and the U-2 flew for four years before Corona. However, the resolution of the U-2 in the SR-71 imagery was about one foot, which meant that you could identify things that were one foot in length. So if it flew over the parking lot out front, it couldn't read license plates, but it could recognize different types of cars versus trucks versus vans and so on. Corona, on the other hand, had a resolution of 40 feet on its first mission, so it could identify airfields, but it couldn't see individual airplanes or anything like that. Also, when you're flying the U-2, A-12, or SR-71, you're flying really high, and if you look down to take pictures and there are clouds, you just don't take a picture. But the automated satellite was taking pictures of preset places on the ground, so most of the pictures sent back were of cloud cover. But the capability was still there, and over time, the resolution continued to get better and better. And of course, today we have digital downlink, so we don't have to worry about catching film canisters with planes anymore. Now you might wonder, what would happen if a plane failed to catch the film canister and it ended up back on Earth outside U.S. custody? Well, they always re-entered over the ocean, and the canisters were sealed with water-soluble bolts. So if a plane missed a catch, the canister would fall into the ocean, the salt water would dissolve the bolts, and the water would then get into the canister and destroy the film. The canister here at the museum is the very first canister that came back from space with film in it. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is all I have for you today. I hope that you enjoyed your tour and learned a thing or two about the important role that aircraft play in intelligence, surveillance and reconnaissance, and military capabilities. If you noticed any glaring errors, let me know in the comments, and if you have any questions, please direct them to your instructors. Thank you, Al, for letting me steal your tour information, and thank you for listening, and have a safe trip to wherever your next destination is today.